Candy Carter has worked as a television producer for more than 25 years and is now the chief content officer for Knocking.com. Prior to this role, Candy was the executive producer and showrunner for The Tamron Hall Show. She was also executive producer of the iconic daytime TV show, The View, for five seasons. During her tenure, The View was inducted into the Broadcasting Hall of Fame and won an Emmy in 2020 for Best Informative Talk Show. She was also producer of The Oprah Winfrey Show for 15 years. When The Oprah Winfrey Show ended its historic run in 2011, Carter co-founded New Chapter Entertainment. As CEO, her Chicago-based production company originated, developed, and produced unscripted TV shows for broadcasts, cable, syndication, and new media, and launched two talk shows for Telepictures TV and developed an executive produced presentations, pilots, shows for HGTV, Lifetime, Cooking Channel, Telepictures TV, TV One, BET, Fox, own Tyler Perry Studios and PBS. During this episode, you learn about her role as the chief content officer at Knocking.com, get a peek into her time as the executive producer of The Tamron Hall Show, as the executive producer of The View, and as a producer of The Oprah Winfrey Show. We also learn what she considers the highlights of her time as a producer of The Oprah Winfrey Show, and she also provides a detailed breakdown of exactly what a show producer does. I know I needed to really fully understand that. Her pearls of wisdom of what an age has no limit life looks like are awesome, by the way. Finally, she'll share some of her mindset shifts about work and life and what is on her bucket list. Thank you for joining the Age Has No Limit podcast. I'm certain you will enjoy this episode. It's the Age Has No Limit podcast. We're here to show and prove that your age shouldn't prevent you from designing and living the life you want. I'm your host, Patrice Davis. Let's get started. Well, welcome back to the show. Um, And as you all know, I have with me Candy Carter. So Candy, we're going to jump right into the questions because I'm really eager to learn more about you and just really, of course, share everything that we can about, um, you know, your no limit life, your life redesign. And as I think I mentioned to you before that that's where I learned about you uh, was from a good housekeeping, I believe it was a good housekeeping article. Um, Would love to take a dive um, into into that. So if you can please though, start by telling us a little bit about where you're from. Well, shockingly, because everybody is surprised by this. I'm from Merrimack, New Hampshire. Mm -hmm. And I'm a dark skinned African-American woman. And anytime I meet people of color, they go, you're from where? (laughs) So yeah, I grew up in New Hampshire. My dad uh, moved there when we were 10 and um, I was there through college. I went to Boston college, so I wasn't far from home. I ran track at Boston college. My first job out of college was 11 months after I graduated. I moved to Atlanta, stayed with a cousin, tried to get into the TV business, which is not easy to get into. And after 11 months, I landed an internship at CNN. And at the time, that was in 1991, it was a huge deal because CNN had just launched. The concept of 24-hour news was brand new. And I landed an internship there. Mm -hmm. Uh, Once I finished that internship, my parents left New Hampshire, moved to Milwaukee. So I went to visit. While I was there, I went knocking on doors. It's what I do. One station let me in, WISN TV, and three months later, they offered me a producing job. So I moved from Atlanta to Milwaukee. I was there for a couple of years. I met my husband there, and then I got the job at Oprah, left, went to Chicago, and I was in Chicago for 18 years, uh, 15 of which were working at Oprah. Three was my own production company that I launched after Oprah. And then I moved to the East Coast, brought the family with to take over as executive producer of The View and then Tamron Hall. And now I'm with a company called Knocking and we do e-commerce and media. We do CBS deals. We do local steals and deals around the country. It's a very, very exciting new aspect of television. 
Great, great, great. Thank you so, so much. Now, um, so you've, uh, of course, described just a number of moves that you've made, both physically and, of course, in your career. Um, tell me, and so that's, you know, number of years as either a producer or as an executive producer. So tell me what you enjoyed the most um, and why did you enjoy, you know, a particular location the most, if, if you can share any of that. Well, the thing I love about TV is I literally have never worked a day in my life. Never. It's what I love to do. And I remember when I first got out of college, it was very tempting to just give up because it's really, really hard to get TV jobs. I don't know why, maybe because it's not as common as banking or marketing or whatever, but it is, it's just challenging. And a couple of times people were like, well, why don't you just go do this? And why don't you just go do that? And had I done that, I would not be where I am today. And so I just love storytelling. I love taking a big story and just cutting it down to the best two minutes or three minutes. And I can do that in my sleep. I can look at something and, and take the story. You know, I can meet somebody and find their story. It's that's what I do. And so I would say at every stop, I learned more. Like, obviously when I was younger, I was really learning the business and how to actually produce. Once I got to Oprah, it's all about storytelling from here on out. Even doing e-commerce is storytelling. If I'm selling a pair of slippers on a show, I'm telling a story about the founder, you know, or the fabrics or how it happened. It's all about storytelling. And so for me, it's in my blood. It's who I am. So every stop along my way has been incredible. Obviously, Oprah was special. That was like lightning in a bottle, right? But being an executive producer, The View was amazing, you know, helping the Tamron Hall show get its, on its feet was amazing. So all of it is great, but it all comes down to storytelling. That's at the core of everything I do. Yeah, that's interesting. So um, real quick side note. So I actually, my my undergrad degree was in mass communications. My plan was to be an executive producer of a, tel of, of a children's show. Um, and I wanted to do it in the Caribbean. There currently isn't a pan-Caribbean children's show. So it's interesting mm. you said that. And it is absolutely true um, that it is very hard to break into that particular industry. So yeah. I ended up just uh, moving into advertising and did advertising for the first part of my career um, because- uh, for that ex ex same exact reason. It's just kind of challenging to make it in. Really? There. Mm -hmm. um, so I think I mentioned to you that I first learned about you, Candy, when I was preparing for the third episode of the Age Has No Limit podcast. I read this really great series that was written by, uh, that was published in Good House Housekeeping and it was called The Transformation Diaries. Mm -hmm. And I learned that, of course, and of course, as I was preparing for our uh, uh, um, time together, I learned that you actually worked for the Oprah Winfrey show again for 15 years. Um, what would you say was the highlight of that experience? And I'm thinking you probably have quite a few highlights working for the Oprah Winfrey show. I have so many. Um, I would say one of the two of the most rewarding things I ever did. So a lot of people would say, oh my God, did you do favorite things? Did you do the, you know, this, this or that kind of the big flashy things? And that kind of wasn't my jam. You know, I was able to do things that Oprah really wanted to do. Um, and I was and I was able to just execute these kind of incredible things. One of the best pieces of television I've ever produced was a Martin Luther King Jr. show that we did. Went to Oprah's office, it's Martin Luther King Day comes. And I just said to her, like, I don't want to show people getting sprayed by hoses and that same old footage that we see every year. What can we do differently? And she had the idea of taking the I Have a Dream speech because it was an anniversary and bringing that speech to life. And mm -hmm. so again, it comes down to storytelling. How do we do that? And we looked at the themes in the speech, justice, mm -hmm. you know, interracial marriage. Um, yeah, I forgot what the other ones were. And just the idea of, of different people coming together, holding hands. And so we built this special and Target sponsored it. And it was the biggest budget I've ever had. I mean, I had helicopters, I had kids in the desert, I had special needs kids in the gardens by the White House. I mean, we shot all over the country and we told these incredible stories and it was just an absolutely beautiful piece of art. That's what I call that. And the second show that was incredible um, was I did a show, Oprah wanted to have um, an entire audience of men who had been abused as boys. Mm -hmm. And for a number of reasons, as you can imagine, the stigma, the this, the that, the healing, the just, it, it had never been done. 
And when I went in her office, I was like an entire audience because I was like 180 people versus maybe 50. No, we booked an entire audience. It took us five to six weeks, which is a lot because we do a show in a week, right? And maybe even longer. Maybe it was five months. I don't remember, but it was very hard. Tyler Perry was involved. Um, We did this thing where we asked the men to bring a picture of themselves as children so that the audience could imagine the pain of a child going through that, even though you're hearing it from a grown man. Mm -hmm. And in, I remember when they all came in through the audience holding, they were holding their pictures, waiting to get their frames. And you could just feel the energy in the room. It was, I I just was in tears and I ran an Oprah in the hallway and she's like, no, no, mm -mm, hold it. I want to, I want to experience it for the first time when I'm in the studio with all of these men. So we ended up winning an award. We won a special Emmy for it. It was a two-part series. It was, it was groundbreaking television really. Um, And, and men were able to see themselves in a way on television. They'd never been able to see themselves before. So those I'd say were my two biggest highlights. And that's not what people think it is because they always want to say, Oh, it's favorite things. It's like, no, no. And there were others, but those are the two highlights, I would say. Ones that stick out the most. Yeah, because I'm actually thinking if I remember watching that particular episode, and I'm I'm sure I would have remembered it if 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 I actually watched that one. Um, so thank you for that. Now, one question that I do want to ask you, if you can let us know, because I think I'm not clear and I think maybe others aren't as well uh, as well. Can you tell me what a producer does? What what does a producer do? do? I would love to know that. <laughs> well, a producer, if you think about a company, like a producer is the CEO. So everything about that show goes through the producer. So the executive producer, I would say, is more like the president of a company, right? So everybody kind of reports to you and every single piece of that show you're weighing in on. So who's going to be the guest? What color are the graphics? Are we going to play music when they walk out? What is the host wearing? Um, Are the hair and makeup people hired? Is the crew and staff hired? Um, you know, what's the order, how, you know, every single decision that goes into making a show, doing a show every day is like running a business. You have about 120 to 140 employees, depending on the show. You have people who are camera people and technical people. You have people who are producers and the creatives. You have support staff, right? So you have people who do accounting, HR, publicity, marketing, all of those things feed editors. You have a whole editing team. So all of that feeds into this day-to-day show. And as a producer, you typically have a segment, right? So let's say we have a whole show, but your segment is interviewing Tom Cruise. So the producer would be in charge of the entire segment. So calling Tom Cruise's manager, making sure he's available on this date. He says yes. Then coming back, the producer tells everybody, okay, he's all set. Then the producer has to go find images of him over the years. What's he doing? Do a bunch of research, write the script, you know, organize it. Then set up his travel to get him to the show. Set up his travel day of, have the car, go pick him up at the hotel, bring him. Then you have to greet him when he comes in. How are you? Then the producer walks him into the green room. And then the producer says, okay. We have five things we want to talk about today. This is called a briefing. The producer goes in, briefs the guest. Here's what you can expect, blah, 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 blah. They fill out a release form, make sure it's okay to have them on TV. And then you escort the guest to the stage. They do the interview. You come back, you get everybody's stuff, you help them out the door. That is what a producer does. And then an executive producer is over all of those little segments and then every other piece of the show, hiring, firing, you name it. It's like running a company. Wow. Yeah. Thank you so much. I've never had no idea exactly what a producer does, but thank you so much for really, really laying that out. Um, I'm sure a lot of people will learn from that. Um, So one of the things is, you know, of course, you've then made that transition, as you mentioned earlier in the show, Um, you are now with Knocking. And one of the things that you wrote on the Knocking website is that you were learning something new every day. And so what did you think? learned that was the biggest aha for you in this new space as the chief content officer? 
Well, you know, yes, I'm the chief content officer for a company called Knocking.com, and we are an e-commerce production company. So if you ever watch morning shows and you see CBS deals where we have products that are in the show and the hosts are there and it's like, oh my goodness, this back thing, it's revolutionary and it's 40% off. So the idea that you can sell products inside of content, that's been around for a little bit. It's been on social media for a while, but now we're really taking that to the next level. You know, we're doing it in daytime TV where people have seen it, but we're also looking at scripted shows and unscripted and award shows and movies and, and, and you know, hospitality and airlines, places where you have a captive audience. So that's what I do now, but I'm 54 years old. Mm-hmm. And so I have been in television show running, meaning running a show for many, many, many years. And while I was doing my last show, which was Tamron Hall, I brought knocking to Disney because I wanted to build an e-commerce program for my talk show, because that was a way to generate more revenue. Mm -hmm. So you get ad revenue, but it's like, this was kind of found money. I could put something in the show. People love it. They love e-commerce, right? And media, and they'll shop and I will bring more revenue to my show. So when I met Knocking, uh, we worked together. Mm-hmm. And after, I guess, a couple of years, I ended up transitioning off the show. And I said, well, what if I came and worked for you guys? Mm-hmm. So this was an opportunity that was already there. And it was a very natural transition. I was looking at other opportunities, but I love the idea of being television adjacent, but learning something new. And so Every day, which is what I wrote in that article, is e-commerce, it's connected to TV, but it's its own business. So the idea that I could be a middle-aged woman learning a brand new skill set every single day, it's all nuanced. I mean, you can't just say like, oh, I'm going to go produce e-commerce. I mean, people have been doing e-commerce for years and years and years, and there is strategy around how do you get people to go to their cart? How do you get people to check out? What's a conversion rate? There's pricing issues. I mean, it's a whole nother language. It's a whole nother business. So where it's connected to the business I did for 30 years, it's not that business. It's something entirely different. So every single day, even to this day, I've been here almost two years, I'm still learning, but I love it because I can think of many, many people who are just stuck they're like, I've been doing the same thing for 30 years. I'm bored out of my mind. Yeah. And so I feel like it's a blessing to be in this space and in this place where I'm learning new things and I feel invigorated by it. Okay. So um, I definitely want to pick back up on that. And I definitely want to find out about that transition from being um, a producer, then of course, an executive producer. And now of course, being the ch- chief content officer at um, at Knocking. Um, one thing that I think is really interesting, I'm so glad you mentioned that. Um, so I also have Ready, Set, Go Consult, which is a coaching program for new consultants. I And, and folks that listen to the show know that I have a consulting firm. Um, and you're absolutely right. You know, the conversion rates, it's just everything that, that you need to make sure you have in place and work perfectly. It's not about having it in place. The image the timing, the messaging, um, making right. sure you have, you know, funnels that work really well and that your funnel is actually, you know, um, nurturing folks um, that you're right. It's a completely different language. I'm so glad I've entered that space and it keeps uh, keeps things exciting, I think. So thanks mm-hmm. for talking about that, because I think sometimes people um, are, aren't aware of just what actually goes into being an effective um, e-commerce, uh, you know, um, company. So- 100%. Yeah. So we'd love to learn about that transition though. Once you actually landed at knocking, what were some of the things that you were thinking about in terms of the transition? Well, I had already been working with knocking. So I understood kind of what I could, what I could bring to the table. And so a lot of it was like just revamping the website, revamp, you know, what I do is I look at story and I make it so that it's like exciting and headliney and people pay attention. And so I looked at the business and said, wow, look at all these amazing assets. Look at all the things that we're doing. And we redid the website. We did a bunch of videos. We kind of brought the messaging together. One of the big things was to come in and really help the production piece because where we're the perfect marriage is I'm a production person and they didn't have that at knocking. So I brought 
we have a content house in New Jersey and that's where we film all of our content. You know, we kind of pulled all that together. I brought in some incredible producers from the business and a head of post-production and we just created this world-class um, production team and we can really do anything. We can scale, right? And what we do as a company is that we go to a media partner and we say, hey, if you would like to incorporate e-commerce in your TV show, I have a skilled group of Emmy award-winning producers who can come in and say, how do we make it look like you? Mm -hmm. And that's what we do best. So really I was able to come in and just bring expertise, bring people, you know, really hone in the storytelling, build the social media, you know, press, we did it all. Um, and it was really great because when you work in corporate environments, you can't always come in and make a difference. Yeah. Yes. And definitely. Real credit to the founders of our company. So Brian Meehan, um, Marcus Raymond, and um, Stefan Diffel. I think that's how I say his last name. He's in Germany. But the three founders are incredible. And they were very open to, hey, we're hiring you because you have this expertise. You know, so in, in your lane, have at it. Yeah. And I really appreciate that. And, and I think we all complement each other really well. And the company's growing. I mean, we were just on the Inc. 5000 fastest growing company list. Mm -hmm. um, so it's very exciting. Second year in a row. Okay. Well, that's, that's, that's fantastic. And I'm sure um, they realize, um, you know, all, every day now that you're there, what just how much of an asset you are to the company. Um, now, what about mindset shifts? What are some of the mindset shifts, if any, you had to experience? Because again, learned about you in Transformation Diary. So there was a transformation that happened. And in your transformation, were there any shifts in the way that you thought about work, about life, about, you know, just some of the things that could happen, you know, that can happen when you are redesigning your life, so to speak? Well, what's really interesting, though, is it was very freeing for me. That was the shift. Because I've worked in these I've worked at studios. I've worked on shows where I had to be in. I mean, I was going in during the pandemic. We were in the studio, double masked. You know, nobody was going anywhere. And we were driving into New York City and going into a studio. So for the first time, I mean, this is an e-commerce company that has no offices. It's a work from anywhere culture. It's, it's this very, they've been doing it, but now the world is doing it. So the biggest transformation for me was the freedom from having to go in some place five days a week, right? Being in a space, being within an environment that was very rigid, mm -hmm. working for large corporations to this nimble, exciting, fun, four-year-old company, mm -hmm. right? That has employees in Argentina and Canada. I mean, that was the shift. There's no shift in the work. I'm just learning new things, but I'm applying TV principles to it. So that's that wasn't so new. But the idea of having this kind of open work environment and the type of people who've already worked in that environment, it's just it was super exciting. And it was just like sky's the limit. And everybody in the company is so like, let's go. You know, my boss will always say like, you know, the, we have a rocket ship. That's our thing. And he's like, blast off rocket ship. It's just a very exciting um, everyday existence. And you don't see that in corporate America. Like that's not, that's not how it works. <laughs> you know what I mean? You got people like, slugging to work, you know, tired of the commute, a little angry, <laughs> you know. It's a very, it was a very freeing transition. Yeah. Yeah. I like that a lot. Um, speaking of sky's the limit, what does an age has no limit life look like to you? Oh, age has no limit. It's very interesting. Cause I said my age earlier, I said I was 54, I'll be 55 in February. And, um, I find that a lot of people who are happy and open mm -hmm. have no age limit. Yeah. Yeah, that's a great. Oh, I, I love it. find that a lot of my friends who are rigid and um, just not open, like I'm always like, I turn nothing down but my collar, right? Mm -hmm. Yes, <laughs> yes to everything, mm -hmm. and you have to. I think you just have to be open to life, and I think as we get older, we get more set in our ways. And I get that you've lived a little, right? You're like, I know I don't like that. I don't like that. But what I find with a lot of people is that they will tell you what they're not going to do mm -hmm. right out the gate. 
And that just shuts off so much opportunity for love, for life, for travel, for growth, for youth, Mm -hmm. for anything. And I just say yes to everything. I try this, I try that, food, exercise. You don't have to have a lot of money to try stuff. You know, sometimes trying stuff is just spending time with different people. You'd be surprised how many people just don't go out. Yeah. Mm, yeah. I don't want to go out anymore. I'm too old for that. Are you? <laughs> Are you? <laughs> and and that's that age, age has no limit is a mindset. It's a mindset because you can you can basically set your mind to being sedentary, not leaving, and you become an older person inside and out. Or you can be free and joyful and happy. And that's the other thing I find with you know, I'm middle age now. So a lot of people over 50, there's, there, there are real things that happen after 50 yeah. parents are dying, you know, friends are passing away. People are getting cancer. Like real things are happening mm-hmm. and it's how you respond to that. Mm-hmm. That helps you be your best, right? Where age has no limit. So you can let it impact you and you can spiral, or you can understand that there are seasons and some seasons are more painful than others, but there's another season right around the corner. Yeah, yeah. You have to embrace that idea. And that, a friend, I'll tell you this really quick, a friend of mine, her name is Patience Nelson. She told me that there was a friendship thing with her and a good friend. And and she said, you know, Candy, there is a season for everything, including friendships. And that just like freed me to say, if this doesn't happen anymore, that it's okay. There is another season. I may miss that person or that thing. I may mourn that. Um, but you have to gear up for that next season of life. Mm-hmm. And and I think that's where a lot of people get stuck. Wow. Um, so, so much of what you're saying resonates with me. There are a number of things that I, there's so much I can unpack from that. But in the interest of time, you, in respect for your time, I'm <laughs> I, I mean, I, I you saw me just shaking my head. I was <laughs> feeling it all up in here, all up in here. So there are a couple of things, though. I do want to first of all, the the idea that one makes a choice, right? Um, you either make a choice that you're going to be more open. I believe that this is a choice, and I do realize that people experience different types of trauma, and it takes time mm-hmm. for them to, you know, work through the trauma. And sometimes they never actually work through it. But you still have mm-hmm. to make a choice at some point that That's you're going right. to be more open to life. I'm open to living. And therefore the limits on your life are immediately lifted because you've decided you've made that decision to, to, um, you know, actually experience more life. It also reminds me of Shonda Rhimes book, the, the age or is it the year of yes. I never Mm -hmm. read the book, but I never really understood that title until recently. And it just reminded me of what you, what you just said, just reminded me of, of it as well. Just, you know, it's time, you know, remain open and you just never know what mm-hmm. you're what you're going to be you know open to love open to so many different things but right. like i said i didn't want to take time and just kind of again everything that you said was i just i was feeling it so <laughs> <laughs> just two final <laughs> questions for you um okay. um and you know would love to know if you have a bucket list that's something we ask all the guests on the show if you have a bucket list um and the second question the second part is are you okay with sharing two things that are on your bucket list I wouldn't say I have a bucket list, but I would say the thing that I want to do more of is travel. Mm -hmm. So I have a son with special needs and it's hard to find. I mean, we really have just my father-in-law who will come and like stay, um, you know, for longer periods of time, but I want to go to Africa. I haven't been to Asia. There's a lot of places I haven't been. And, um, yeah, I don't want to wait. Mm -hmm. I don't want to wait to the last minute. So that's been a challenge. Um, but I'm hoping, I can get more travel in, but those would be my bucket list. I want to go to Africa and I want to go to Asia. Many yep. countries. Yeah, absolutely. That's that's on my bucket list. And I'm actually putting that into action now. So Good. Ghana, I would love to do Tanzania, Ethiopia, and um Kenya. All I would like to do a three-month stint in, you know, and I can do that. Part of the reason I started this business was so that I can work from anywhere. Um that's right. Good I'm, for you. I'm trying to live that no limit life. So that's right. 
Well, first of all, again, I'd love to thank you um, and not love to. I am thanking you for <laughs> spending some time with uh, with me and with our listeners so they can learn more about you, Candy. Um, and I really, really appreciate you taking the time to meet with us and sharing so much about your transitions, your career, your a little bit about your family life. Uh, but yeah, so thank you again for your time. And as I always say, age has no limit. And Candy, of course, is the epitome of that. Thank you, Candy. Thank you. I'm sure you enjoyed that episode. We heard Candy's pearls of wisdom about what an age has no limit life looks like to her. And I really enjoyed how she sums up her observation of people who are open versus those who are closed. She also said that the only thing she turns down is her collar. Well, I'm absolutely grateful that she did not turn down my request to be a guest on the podcast and agreed so that you all could hear just how much she has to share, how much we can learn from her. I really thank Candy for, again, saying yes and agreeing. And I thank you for listening to the Age Has No Limit podcast. Remember, age has no limit.